My name is Steve Rendell. I'm Senior Analyst at FAIR. That's Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, the National Media Watch Group. I'm also co-host of FAIR's national radio show, Counterspin. Okay, and um, can you give me a, a brief overview of both the print and television press leading up to the war in Iraq and kind of their performance? In assessing how good a job the media is doing at covering a given story, in this case the Iraq story, we like to imagine first what good coverage would look like. In other words, how a healthy journalism culture would cover the story. And in the case of Iraq and the war in Iraq, a story as important as war, a very grave issue, we think that there are certain minimum requirements that the media should fulfill. One is they should provide a broad debate. Two, they should provide independent and accurate information. Three, the uh, media should feature a press corps asking tough questions of those in power. And four, we think that journalism should provide context for the stories they're reporting on. There's many other points to be made, but these are four absolutely uh, indisputable points that media ought to do. In FAIR's assessment of the coverage of the run-up to the war and the war in Iraq, the media fell short in all four of these areas. Okay, and maybe we can go through each each one of the four. So just the, the first one, um, I believe, is that they didn't pro provide enough debate. Debate, or? yeah. <clears throat> as far as providing a broad debate, frankly, the media did a miserable job. In the run-up to the war, FAIR conducted a study of the three major networks' nightly newscast plus PBS's News Hour with Jim Lair. And we found that at a time when 60% of Americans were saying that more time should be given to negotiations and to the UN weapons inspectors, just 6% of the sources appearing in stories about Iraq uh, held that point of view. So in the world of nightly news, 6% of uh, the sources were skeptics. In the real world, in the greater US population, 60% were skeptics. At that same time, only 1% of sources appearing in these four nightly news shows were against the war outright. Uh, we call that other, um, just, just to add, that 6% number is a group that we called skeptics. They weren't necessarily anti-war because given more time and more inspections, they may have actually come out later and said, yes, now it's time to go to war. I don't think this is going to be useful, but I just want to make clear here. So at a time when one, when these networks were showing 1% were against the war and 6% were skeptical of the war. In the real world, about 25% of Americans were outright against the war. And another 61%, according to Gallup, were for giving the UN and the weapons inspectors more time for negotiations and inspections. Uh, this is a misrepresentation of, of the reality on the ground. Um, once the war got underway, FAIR undertook a story um, well, I'm not, I'm not going to cover during the war, and I want to follow You're up. only in the run-up. Yeah, I'm only doing the run-up. So oh, okay. Oh, I'm I didn't know that. Right. March 19th. So, um, so I guess the, the question is, uh, kind of characterize the, the breakdown of you know, how many government official sources uh, relative to other non-governmental sources. So we found that at a time when well over 60% of Americans were either opposed to the war or thought more time should be given to inspections and negotiations, that dissent was represented on the nightly news in just 7% of the sources. On the other hand, official voices overwhelmed these network newscasts. 76% of all sources in Iraq stories in the two-week study that we did in February of four national news shows were official voices, that is, current or former government officials or military officials. That leaves very little room for the sort of dissent that should be included in any sort of broad debate and the expert voices, those voices from academia that might fill in a lot of the important context that has to happen uh, if Americans are going to be informed as they go in, as they embark on uh, a war. Um, in other words, with 76% of all the sources, official voices overwhelmed all other voices. As we put it at the time, the networks acted as an official megaphone. When government officials account for more than three quarters 
of the sources in news stories, it leaves very little room for dissent and for those sorts of expert voices, those academics, those authors who might fill in a lot of the needed context. As we put it at the time, these networks were acting as megaphones for official views. Okay, and um, just uh, and some questions about process. Um, when you're looking at the television news, um, in a lot of ways this story seems like there's a lot of sins of omission, that there's stuff that's not being covered. So can you speak to that and kind of where do you get information that's not being covered by the nightly newscasts on this issue? Wow, that's another big one. So um, I mean, there's so let's, many. Let's go First to, of all, uh, half of myths. it would be... The myths. Um, you know, some of the, the myths of the coverage of inspectors getting kicked out. It's, you know, there is a... Yeah, okay. In addition to inaccurate reporting, there are these recurring myths. These are stories that are too good to check out because they fit into the official view of things. Take the myth that Saddam Hussein and the regime in Iraq kicked out the UN weapons inspectors in 1998. What actually happened in 1998 was the United States wanted to embark on an especially heavy bombing campaign. It had its own name. It was called Operation Desert Fox. And President Clinton, Clinton's White House, asked the UN to withdraw the weapons inspectors so they, should, they could go forth with this campaign. It's and the Clinton administration asked the UN to withdraw the weapons inspectors so they could go forward with this campaign. That's what actually happened. But in the world of American reporting, the myth is repeated over and over again that in 1998 Saddam Hussein kicked the weapons inspectors out. That myth has been, that myth itself has been corrected three separate times by the New York Times, the most vaunted uh, journalism outlet in the United States. Likewise, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, was appearing on the news hour with Jim Lehrer several months before the war started in a one-on-one -on -one interview. And in the course of this interview, Rumsfeld said two things that were untrue. He said two falsehoods. He said, one, in 1998, Saddam Hussein kicked out the UN weapons inspectors. But he said another thing, too. He said in 1990 that the Iraqi military had mobilized on the Saudi border several hundred thousand soldiers and were poised to invade Saudi Arabia. Uh, he repeated that story on the news hour. The fact behind that story is that Gene Heller, an excellent reporter for the St. Petersburg Times, at the time back in 1990 and 1991, looked into that story. The first Bush White House claimed that this mobilization had happened on the Sorry, uh, is this getting too much well, the, inside? Well, the, um, I think what, what, you, what I have for at that point, I think is, is good for what I need for that. I want to move to um, kind of Fair's role as a, a watchdog. I know when I was talking to you on the, on the phone, you, you, a lot of people compare Fair as the, say that Fair is the left watchdog and the Media Research Center is the right watchdog for uh, conservative bias or whatever. So uh -huh. kind of compare the, the watchdog role of Fair versus other groups. Okay. Um, FAIR is a national media watch group that comes at things from a progressive point of view. We advocate for those voices that we think are underreported or that we see as slighted in U.S. mainstream media. That would include the poor, working people, women, people of color, environmental and consumer rights voices. We also call attention to the fact that American media is being concentrated into fewer and fewer corporate hands every day. And that's bad for the culture, it's bad for the democracy, and it's especially bad for reporting. Uh, viewers, uh, media consumers, uh, citizens need to draw from a broad array of voices in order to make informed decisions and to fulfill their role as, as, as members of a, a vital democracy. And this is threatened, we think, by the further corporate concentration and commercialization of the media. In the United States, we have a media system that not only suffers from uh, pressures that come from above, from corporate ownership, but also other corporate commercial pressures that come in from the side as far as advertising pressures. Every year, FAIR publishes a report called the Fear and Favor Report in which we show how stories were either killed or altered or in some cases, positive stories generated in order to suit the needs and the prerogatives of those corporate, uh, the corporate owners and sponsors, and in some cases, government.
And can you trace that also into the think tanks, the studies that you look and monitoring think tanks and the corporate influence also coming in from the experts that are appearing on the media? Sorry, that's, uh, that one got past me. The, uh, the well, I guess uh, the experts that are, are, are talking on the nightly newscast, let's say, are uh, a lot of them are from think tanks, and a lot of the think tanks could also have um, that sort of bi institutional bias and uh, any just general thoughts on... Yeah, that's more complicated. I mean, I don't think that follows necessarily from this. The fact is that we've d documented, we do something called Think Tank Monitor. It's a once a year study where we show that right and centrist think tanks dominate the sort of um, in, in the way that, uh, um, sorry, uh, this is another whole huge story to me. Okay, well, it's the, perhaps um, I have too much information about this. The point is that nightly newscasts, newspapers, uh, magazines, radio draw on, on right-wing and centrist think tanks far more often than they go to the left. But I, I, I think that's a whole complicated story in which there's a million other questions that fall out. You know, what, what is your general thoughts on the claim of liberal media bias and that the journalists are too liberal and that uh, that's influencing their coverage too much? The myth of liberal media bias is like a table that's supported by four very rickety legs. One is you have to believe that most reporters are liberal. Well, that's not what the Pew, the recent Pew study found. It found that, um, I, do we want to get into this detail? Because it found that 34% said they were liberal and 17% said they were conservative. That means that, you know, 66% well, are say they're not liberal. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I see, and one of the points I'm trying to make in the film is that the editors and institutional biases of the media and, and have a higher predictive factor of how stories are going to be covered rather than the liberal media bias. If you take an example of the Iraq war coverage, for example, how would Iraq war coverage indicate if you were to predict a liberal media Okay, bias? let me tell you what's wrong with some of your questions from my point of view. Okay. I, we, have a, we did a study. Uh, I mean, we did a study in like 2000 where we surveyed hundreds of Beltway journalists about economics issues, and they turned out to be on almost every economics issue to the right of the general population. We took questions that had been asked in Gallup and Roper and, and you know, Zogby polls and asked them of journalists and found that journalists were th to the right of the general population on economics issues. On social issues, I haven't seen any hard number studies. I haven't seen any reliable studies. But my guess is that journalists tend to be slightly more liberal than the average American on issues like um, tolerance of homosexuality or or on sort of progressiveness on race issues and that sort of thing. They may be slightly more. The, the fallacy behind the myth of the liberal media is these people say that they can show that so many people voted for Bill Clinton, therefore the media is liberal. One thing we'd first argue is that, first of all, Bill Clinton was not a liberal. He was pro-death penalty, pro-NAFTA. He, he, uh, he dismantled welfare reform. Uh, to, to uh, I, I mean, he dismantled welfare, uh, the welfare reform. Uh, the, the fact is, Clinton was, by his own uh, testimony, a centrist. He wasn't a liberal. So we would say, you know, I'm trying to distill this stuff that's a very complicated argument. Look, Clinton, a lot of people say, a lot of, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to stay on camera doing that. <laughs> Look, a lot of people say that, 90, that 89% of, in 1992, 89% of journalists said they would have voted for Clinton over, over Bush's father. Fine. Clinton was running as a centrist, as a very conservative Democrat. What Molly Ivan said, Bill Clinton's the only Republican I ever voted for. Uh, we, put the, we tried to turn the question around and said, what if a very moderate Republican, William Weld, from Massachusetts, was running against a, uh, a left liberal Democrat, say Jesse Jackson, those numbers would have been turned around. You would have seen something in the neighborhood of 90% of reporters saying they would vote for Weld. Journalists are mainly centrist. That's what the latest Pew study showed too. It showed that a minority of journalists said they were liberal. Uh, an even smaller number, it's true, said that they were conservatives. But the vast majority did not avow either liberalism or conservatism. But that, but that whole argument, if we accept that whole argument that what shoe leather journalists believe 
ends up on the page or coming over the radio or on the television screen, I mean, I, I just think that's wrong. If you want to find out the institutional philosophy of a corporation, you don't go to the shop floor worker. You go to the decision makers. You go to the managers. You go to the uh, factory owner. Uh, likewise, if you want to find out what the institutional philosophies and institutional biases of television networks are, you go to the executives. You go to the top producers. And the top producers tend to lean to the right. Uh, the owners, God knows, of NBC News, I mean, this is owned by General Electric. Uh, Fox, of course, is Rupert Murdoch. Perhaps Eisner at Disney is slightly more liberal than the others, but we can't find it in studies. When we do studies of, um, of uh, say, for instance, the Iraq War and how much dissent is included, sorry, What's much more interesting to me is to look at the relationships of these major media companies that own the networks and the government. Every one of these, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, they all have business before the government. Every one of these corporations is asking the government to loosen ownership limits so that they can own even a larger piece of the broadcasting spectrum. What do they do? When it's election time, all of these corporations give money to both the Democrats and the Republicans, hoping to get in return felicitous legislation having to do with, with liberalizing ownership standards so that they can own even more of the media pie, so they can make even more money off the media. When it's not election season, these same media corporations are squirting money at Washington, D.C. through lobbying. So that's that's the thing that's much more interesting as far as I'm concerned to look at, to look at the constellation of conflicts of interest that exist before our media system, particularly the networks and the government. They're too close. There's a whole other story to here too, which is the social lives of Bigfoot journalists. If you look at those glamour journalists that sort of move back and forth between Washington, D.C. and New York City, you're talking about people who live at a level in a stratosphere that is not familiar to most Americans. You're talking about people who are in many cases millionaires who rub shoulders with the powerful all the time. They go to parties together, they play tennis together, uh, they socialize with the very subjects that they are supposed to be scrutinizing. One of the things that we say at FAIR all the time is that one of the most important tasks of journalism is to go to those in power and hold their feet to the fire. So we ask the question, how can you hold somebody's feet to the fire if you were at dinner at their house the night before? And this is a whole another problem. So you have a problem of our national media, particularly uh, network television, being too close to government. So what you have is a constellation of conflicts of interest. The networks have business before the government. They give major campaign donations, hoping for friendly legislation back. So they're locked together through financial arrangements, but they are also too close socially in many cases. I think that. Okay, um, look, I'm going to move to um, the approach that Fair takes, and it seems to me more of a scientific, statistical approach where you look at the, both the positive and the hypothesis, the null hypothesis, but you can you can determine in different however way you want to. But then an approach of Media Research Center, I see merely a picking out of evidence that supports the thesis while ignoring other. One of the biggest differences between FAIR, which is the only national media watch group that comes at things from the left of center in the United States, and those that are on the right of center, is that FAIR loves journalism. There's nothing that we love more than seeing hard-hitting journalism, than hearing journalists ask tough questions of those in power, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. We love journalism. Most of us were journalists before we got here. When you look at those on the right of center, particularly probably the most eminent Media Watch group from the right of center now, is the Media Research Center, headed by Brett Bozell. They don't like journalism. They don't like to hear hard-hitting questions when those questions are targeted at the people that they see as their friends, conservatives, the Bush White House. They want the media to be tame. If you look at the period around the uh, Afghanistan war, you'll see that the Media Research Center actually were applauding the media and saying they were doing a great job. Why? Because they, the media were basically recording zero dissent. 
there was almost no nothing. This is at a time when when journalists on several of the networks were wearing flag lapel pins. And sorry, I just touched that. If, you, go, if you focus on maybe uh, if you if you looked at their coverage leading up to the war in Iraq, it, that might be pertinent, more pertinent than Afghanistan. But if not, you can you, go ahead. Um, well, I, I was just going to say, I, I, just just as an example, I, I don't really have anything uh, okay, uh, right. up there. I think, f first of all, the there is a big difference in approach, too. FAIR uses generally accepted social science standards and sometimes looks at media from a scientific point of view. We also, most of our work is anecdotal, it's not social science. On the other hand, uh, the approach that most of the right of center media watchers use is just, you know, finding something that's not good for conservatives or is not good for the Bush White House and whining about it. Um, I, I, I probably don't want to be quoted saying that. That's all they do, though. I mean, that's that really is their their thing. Is if well, somebody asks a tough question, it's uh, of one say, of their and friends. It's a pressure group. You know, they're trying to. We are too. I, I I don't say we're different that way. We're different in professionalism and a pro and and um, and sort of uh, replicability of approach. Uh, I don't think we're different in the, I think we're both uh, public interest groups that are pushing a certain point of view. There's no doubt that FAIR wants more of these progressive voices that we, that I can demonstrate very clearly are cut out of, of most debates. Most of the debate that happens in the United States is between the center and the right. And the center largely and the right almost completely were for the war in Iraq. So you had a debate basically between the center, which may have had some qualms, and the right. If you look at, to compare FAIR's approach to media criticism in a few words to the approach that the right wing takes is FAIR is journalism affirming and the right wing media critics are basically journalism bashing. They don't like to see good hard hitting journalism when it comes to probing questions aimed at their friends. Um, you wanted something more well, specific than that. I guess um, the point that I was trying to, you started and stopped, that, that uh, in a way they're having a confirmation bias, they're only seeking out information that's confirming their beliefs, and then even when evidence is disconfirming those beliefs, they ignore it in a way, so that it's not a scientific approach, it is more episodic, so that's you know, well, however you want to phrase that point. I realize you do do some episodic stuff here as well. And oh, a lot, a lot. Actually, I do more of the studies than anybody here, but most of our work, if you look at our magazine, most of our work is anecdotal. We're talking about, for instance, let me give you one, a, a story that, that is never told. Um, well, this isn't for you, though, because um, it happened after the war. But uh, you know when, when Colin Powell visited Halabja last spring, uh, last, last fall, he visited Halabja, and he gave a big crocodile tear speech about how this was the place where Saddam Hussein gassed his own people. Well, what no media outlet cared to do was to go back to 1988 when uh, this horrible crime took place, and it indeed did take place, and Saddam Hussein was the perpetrator of it, and ask what was the United States doing during this time. Well, it turns out that the U.S. Congress had just passed the Iraqi Genocide Act, Genocide Act of 1988, and the bill was going to the Senate. The, the Reagan administration did not want to see the bill passed because they were siding with Iraq against Iran, and we were supplying them. And if that legislation had passed, it would have put sanctions on Iraq and would have stopped the Reagan administration from aiding Iraq, in some cases actually giving them components for chemical weapons. So Reagan sent his national security advisor to the Senate to try to stop, and indeed he successfully did stop that legislation. That legislation never passed. Do you know who Reagan's national security advisor was? Colin Powell. Colin Powell, in other words, went to the U.S. Senate to kill legislation that would have condemned Iraq for gassing the Kurds at Halabja. And 15 years later, when Colin Powell is visiting Halabja and crying tears about not one single media outlet pointed out that it was Colin Powell's job to kill criticism of Iraq back in 1988. These are the stories. That's, that's anecdotal. That's not a study. That's a story that, that's context. That's the sort of context that we need to have in these stories. Instead of like, you know, after 9-11, you had all these cover stories saying, why do they hate us so? And they usually concluded, came to the same conclusions that George Bush did. They hate us because we're free. 
you know, nonsense like that that went to no depth at all. Uh, the fact is that if you look at the list of grievances that reasonable Arabs and reasonable uh, Muslims have over the last 50 years, you find that you know the USCIA deposed, uh, did a coup against the Shah, uh, against the Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, against the Prime Minister of Iran, Mossadegh. You see that in 1982. Uh, the Reagan administration gave a green light to Israel to invade Lebanon, killing 17,000 innocent civilians. I mean, there's one after another of these episodes that were not included in the context of a lot of these stories. So a lot of times FAIR does deal with this stuff anecdotally. I, most of my articles, indeed, have been stories that are sort of reporting about reporting, uh, that are done like most reporting is not scientific, it's anecdotal. It tells a story and it makes an argument and that's what we mostly do. We also, I think, bolster that work with our social science, with our studies that show which voices are being left out of the debate. Um, I think you won't find the same sort of social science approach. You won't find the same kind of scientific approach on the part of the right-wing media critics. What you find there is mainly they're pick and, picking and choosing comments that they don't like, that they happen to hear on the media. And uh, sometimes they have a point. Occasionally there is a comment from a reporter or an anchor that maybe does betray some slight liberal media bias, but they can't show a systematic pattern. That's the difference. And FAIR, I think, is very good at showing these systematic patterns of bias. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard to talk about the media without addressing that these types of issues. Yeah, did you, had you ever heard, there's only one place that I've ever, uh, the Boston Globe had a piece by Peter Galbraith, who was at one time not ambassador level, but he was like, he was close to ambassador level at, in Iraq uh, during that period. And he wrote a piece in the Boston Globe in 2000 or 2001, way before, um, way before Colin Powell's trip. I wouldn't know about uh, that Colin Powell actually went and killed sanctions against Iraq in 1988. Um, I just think that story is one of the most glaring. Uh, when I told that story at Cambridge University, I was delivering not this study, but the one that came after it, the, there was a gasp in the room. People could not could, couldn't believe that they, it hasn't even been in the British press, which is so odd because, you know, the British press, I mean, it's such an interesting experiment. When you look at the United States, gung-ho for the war, you know, leading the, leading the coalition, uh, in the Iraq war, and you see that our media is almost monolithic in support, uh, brooking very little dissent. But in England, where you have a government that's likewise gung-ho and one of the leaders in the coalition, uh, you have a very pluralistic media. You have a media that really does air a broad debate. Uh, as far as uh, on one side you have the Times of London, the Sun, the Telegraph, all pro-war. On the other side, you have the Mirror, the Observer, the Guardian, the Independent that are questioning the need for war. So you have a really broad and rollicking debate. That has real consequences. There's a reason why on, there's only one place on the planet Earth where large numbers of people believe that Saddam Hussein was connected to the bloody terror attacks of September 11th. And that's in the United States, where poll after poll show 50% or more of Americans believe that the Iraqi regime was involved in the 9-11 attacks. There's a reason that the United States is the only place that, where large numbers of people believe that. And that is because we did not have a media day in and day out questioning official views. In England, a government that was just as gung-ho for the war, large numbers of people never did believe that because they had a real media debate. And for every pundit or reporter that may have raised the possibility of Iraq being involved in 9-11, there were other reporters that were shooting it down and providing evidence that it had never happened. So that's, see, these, these, these aren't just intellectual exercises. The coverage, the lack of pluralism plays out in life. It plays out in, it plays out in the real world. Uh, when you don't have a vibrant debate, people remain ignorant of certain issues. They don't hear. When we hear after the war, David Kay sitting before a congressional hearing and saying in an authoritative voice about weapons of mass destruction, 
we were all wrong. That may sound quite dramatic, but it's not true. It's not true that we were all wrong. Scott Ritter wasn't wrong. Mel Goodman wasn't wrong. Air Force Intelligence wasn't wrong. They all questioned, and there were many others, questioning whether or not Iraq had significant weapons of mass destruction. Those voices were largely cut out of the media in the run-up to the war, and I would dare to say since. Only now are some of them emerging because I think the media felt burned by a lot of the official lies they were told in the run-up and during the war, and now some, they're, you know, they're, they've grown a few teeth. Not enough, but they're starting to ask a little tougher questions. Sorry, that was very rambling. No, but. there was a lot of great you know, clips in there. Um, and do you uh, one? Yes, that was the David K thing clear enough? Yeah, I think so. Okay, because yeah. because um, it it was it was like it was presented as this great huge admission. You know, David K going before Congress saying we were all wrong. Well, as Melvin Goodman from the uh, former CIA official points out, no, we weren't all wrong. A lot of us questioned whether or not Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. You know, I list, you know, Scott Ritter, Melvin Goodman, Air Force Intelligence uh, raised some very strong questions about this. And so that, but you wouldn't know that David Kay was wrong if all you had consumed over the past year and a half was American media because those voices of dissent were largely marginalized and silenced in the national media debate. And when there is a debate, it seems that the media will cover that there is a controversy. But when I've asked, you know, Lawrence Grossman, former NBC produce, you know, producer, you know, he said they, they, they covered it extremely well. But when I asked him what the actual French position was, he couldn't articulate it at all. What the a actual what position? The, the position of the French. And, and, and so what I guess I'm, I'm getting at is what uh, the, uh, when debate does happen, let me let me say as a debate, but not the substance of the debate. Well, first of all, I would hesitate to say that the French position was the other pole, the other single unique pole in the debate. The French position, the French position, as I understand it, was for more time for negotiations and inspections. Uh, that is not per se an anti-war position as you know, after more negotiation was done, after more inspections were carried out, the French might come to the position that a war was necessary. Uh, what I would say is that a, a really a broad debate would include the hawkish point of view of the White House and many of the neocon uh, intellectuals in American society, the point of view that there should be more time given to negotiations and inspections, you know, close to that point of view of the French. And also there's other voices that said war is never the answer. Uh, war is not the answer here. I, I think there's, there's always a mistake that we make in that there's only two points of view in the debate. A real rollicking debate on any kind of complex issue is going to have very many different points on the spectrum, very many different points of view. And so, for instance, you had the hawkish point of view over here. You had the point of view of those who were for more inspections and more negotiations, but who might come to the point where they'd think that war was necessary. And then the point of view of the anti-war voices, those truly dissenting voices that just thought the war was wrong from top to bottom. Uh, that's a broad debate, and any sort of real debate, any sort of journalism community, journalism culture worth the term journalism would have provided that sort of broad-ranging debate. Okay, great. And um, just to bring that back to the numbers that you were um, citing earlier, the I think one or two percent, and then six percent, and then the it was less than. Um, yeah, in in my in in that four network study, uh, by the way, you know, let me just say this too. Yeah, and just to underline the lack of debate in the study that we did of these four network newscasts in February, in the days leading up to the war, just three out of three hundred and ninety-three sources who were heard in stories about Iraq, just three out of three hundred and ninety-three were opposed to the war. This was at a time when millions of people were marching in the streets all around the world and, and at least hundreds of thousands in the United States. That point of view just was not really given any serious consideration on nightly newscasts. Okay, great. Um, let's see the, uh, can you talk about the anti-war coverage that um, happened in the print me news media that, that FAIR had some sort of influence on? Uh, or at least, you know, or, or at least, 
You know, I, the thing is, some of this stuff is so distant to me, I even wrote some of it. You're talking about Senior where team. we pointed out that, uh, what was the thing? It was against... Uh, it was numbers that they, they actually, I, I was wondering if, just on a general terms, if there was how the historically fair has influenced news coverage or corrections or... Uh, and in this instance, the, the run-up to the war in Iraq, I see that, and, and not explicitly acknowledged... Oh, yeah, I don't even remember what date that was, right, where we they, actually got them to do they a... They actually uh, did another story, um, and I was wondering if it was as a result or if you had heard Yeah, anything. definitely. Well, but, we know it was because we generated more than a thousand letters to the Times. I don't, I don't think FAIR could take unique credit for it. Right, I just, think but, some of the anti-war groups um, were, were involved in generating letters, too. Um, in monitoring the coverage of the anti-war movement in the run-up to the war in Iraq, uh, Fair noted that in one case the New York Times had sent a reporter who'd left a demonstration very early and then filed a report significantly undercounting the number of demonstrators at that uh, demonstration. We were able to generate, along with other groups, thousands of letters to the New York Times calling for them to correct the story. Um, without ever admitting any fault in the case, the New York Times actually, very strangely, sent out a reporter and re-reported the story, uh, sort of quietly acknowledging that their initial reporting had not been good. Fair's activists who wrote to the Times, as well as activists from the anti-war movement, are part of a growing movement of people who just are not finding mainstream American media reliable and they're going to alternative sources. In many cases, they're going to websites. Uh, sorry, uh, you don't want, you, you're not getting to that question. Yeah, you can, well, you can get um, to the, I mean, let I me just say that one more time to give you a choice. I think there is a large movement that is disgruntled, yeah. both the left and right, but especially a lot of progressives. And well, I think the right have, if, if you look on national media, you will see dozens. I, I do something called a conservative top 40 every few years. You will find dozens of national pundits who are members of the conservative movement. If you look at, you know, national media, you're talking about Rush Limbaugh, Paul Guichot, Robert Novak, Tucker Carlson, um, Pat Buchanan, people who have, who often uh, condemn the liberal media's bias from their perch high atop the, the media. Um, if you look at progressive movements and anti-war voices, you will find no, you will find no national pundits. Uh, on, especially on national television, who, who actually count themselves among sort of the progressive movement. Um, there are some people who write columns, Norman Solomon, Molly Ivins, who are, who are, to, are left of center, but they haven't reached that sort of Sunday morning chat show level of, of the punditocracy. You just don't see them there. Um, let me take that other thing one more time. FAIR has a listserv or an email list that includes more than 50,000 subscribers and we'll often send out an action alert or a media advisory asking our reporters to politely write to media outlets and we're often able to generate more than a thousand or two thousand letters to these media outlets. Well, FAIR's activists along with anti-war activists who wrote to the Times are part of a growing number, uh, really a movement of people who just don't find mainstream American media reliable anymore and are seeking out other media and alternatives. Great, great. Uh, do you, can you speak to, at all to um, in late February 24th, I believe it was uh, Newsweek that broke the story of Hussein Kamel saying that, you know, in fact that they... Uh, I can speak a little, th th some of these things, let me just say, <laughs> You are coming at me with the most, I do television all the time. So the, the questions that are most complicated and really need a lot of background and are very hard to tell quickly, especially, you know, sometimes when I've been asked questions like this, somebody submits the questions to me beforehand and I actually basically plot out, I don't read uh -huh. a script, but I sort of plot out a way to do them in a sound bite because it's very difficult. Hussein Kamel is very difficult to do. Uh, I'll, I can try to tell it. Um, I can, it's probably going to take me a minute and 15 seconds, though. I won't be able to do it quickly. Uh, was it February 24th? Are you sure? Yeah. And then his name John the, Elliott? The What's name, his name? Uh, John Barry, I think. John the, Barry, that's right. And that, the, well, uh, that was when it actually hit the stands. I, well, I have it written down here. Let me just double check. I know that the, I know the, the story. issue date was like uh, March 6th, but the, um, mm, the date of the issue All right. Well, 
Yeah. Weeks before the war. 24th was, yeah, when it actually hit the air. Um, well, it's more interesting, it's more pertinent to say the date of the issue or just to say several weeks before the war. Okay, that's fine. I'll say that. Okay. When all of this is over and historians look back at the Iraq war and the arguments pro and con in the lead up to the war, one of the most important stories may be a very brief story that appeared in Newsweek magazine several weeks before the war by the journalist John Barry. This story was about Hussein Kamel. Hussein Kamel was Saddam Hussein's son-in-law, and he was privy to all of the deepest secrets of the Iraqi chemical and biological arsenal. Following the Persian Gulf War in 1991, Hussein Kamel defected from Iraq. And Hussein Kamel became a star witness of the American case for war in Iraq. For instance, on February 5th, 2003, when Colin Powell was appearing before the UN Security Council, he cited Hussein Kamal. And he cited Hussein Kamal in order to show that, uh, because Kamal had said that Iraq had had this many chemical weapons, this many biological weapons, and he'd given them mount. And uh, it was quite impressive. What John Barry points out in the Newsweek piece, and what Colin Powell failed to say, is that this star witness also says that immediately following the Persian Gulf War in 1991, Iraq destroyed its entire arsenal of banned weapons. It, it, it had destroyed its entire arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. So you had the U.S. government citing Hussein Kamel where it was convenient, showing that they at one time had had a vast arsenal, but conveniently failing to cite Kamal uh, in the second part of his statements that he made time and again, uh, and that was that Iraq had destroyed all their weapons of mass destruction immediately following the Iraq War. As, as time passes by and as history looks back on this period, I'm afraid that article by John Barry in Newsweek magazine several weeks before the Iraq War started will be seen as a very important article and one that probably should have been read a little more carefully by policy planners and journalists and commentators and others. And did that, did I get that story in? Or? Yeah, I think so. That's yeah. way more than people. a minute. I have it from other okay. as well. And uh, it gives it a little bit more um, text, you know, context and everything. But also, the FAIR actually, uh, it, it wasn't like, it, it, it caught the eye of FAIR enough to actually send out a media alert. And then I think it was uh, Washington Post may have run something uh, up a week later. I or, couldn't say. Okay. That's, that's not um, in my but mind. But at least it, you did cited that FAIR did send a media alert for it, so you can maybe just say that we at FAIR noticed the article and we... So when we saw this little story in Newsweek magazine, 300 odd words, that said that Hussein Kamal had said that Iraq had destroyed its weapons of mass destruction arsenal right after the Gulf War, this raised some issues for us. Because after all, Hussein Kamal was the same man who was being cited, the star witness of the White House's case for war. In fact, Colin Powell had cited Hussein Kamal when he spoke before the UN Security Council on February 5th, 2003, because Kamal had detailed the amounts and the kinds of banned weapons that Iraq had. So here he is all of a sudden in this, here we're reading in Newsweek magazine that he has also said, I'm sorry, I got, just, I got can, lost there. Uh, just, uh, uh, just say when we at FAIR had noticed it, we had we took note and we sent out a media alert. So when we at FAIR saw this little article in Newsweek magazine that said that the star witness of the White House's case for war was also saying that Iraq had totally destroyed its arsenal of weapons of mass destruction immediately after the Persian Gulf War in 1991, we thought this was news. So FAIR put out to our media list, we put out when FAIR saw the John Barry piece in Newsweek uh, pointing out that this high-level defector, Hussein Kamel, said that Iraq had completely destroyed its arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, we thought that should be noted more widely. So we put out uh, an email to our email list asking people to contact media and ask that media to look for deeper into the story. Uh, so that, sorry, did that yeah, work? Just do, just do when we saw the Newsweek piece by John Barry pointing out that this high-level defector, Hussein Kamal, says that Iraq 
completely destroyed its arsenal of weapons of mass destruction right after the Persian Gulf War in 1991, we thought this should be noted more widely in the media. So we put out an alert to our, to our email list of more than 50,000 people trying to get them to contact their media and get more stories looking into this issue. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the, the journalists uh, saying things as if it were fact when they were, you know, dropping qualifiers like uh, alleged? Alleged, and, yeah. The way we see it at FAIR is one of the most important tasks of journalism and journalists is to go to those in power and hold their feet to the fire. Ask the tough questions. But that's often not how it works out in the, re in, in the real world. What we see is journalists deferring to power. For instance, after Colin Powell's address before the UN Security Council on February 5th, 2003, we saw reporters repeating as fact claims that Colin Powell had made earlier in the day at the UN. For instance, just to give you one example, one of the pieces of evidence that Colin Powell presented at the UN was a piece of tape that he said uh, represented one Iraqi officer talking to another Iraqi officer about uh, some sort of banned weapons. Well, Colin Powell presented this and, and made this claim. We saw that allegation by Powell show up in media reports later uh, as then Colin Powell played a piece of audio tape of one Iraqi officer talking to another Iraqi officer. Professional journalism standards dictate that unless that reporter independently confirmed that that's actually whose voices were on the tape and that's what was said, that reporter is obliged to say, then Colin Powell played a tape of um, he claimed. I think one thing that might be useful for me is the weapons of mass destruction over, I mean, you can finish uh, this, this thought and then yeah. also go on to weapons of mass destruction because that was very pervasive of saying, you know, his weapons or, you know, the way they were, say, Saddam's weapons. Or, oh, you mean apart from apart Colin from Powell? Right, right. And, and apart from that. Oh, I thought right. you were talking about the... No, uh, but you can, you can... You were talking so much about action alerts. We actually did an action alert in which we... Uh, I don't know... You know, I, I know that happened all the time. I can't think of a single individual site. Okay, well, you can, you can, I can speak you can, generally about it. You can it. speak to this Colin Powell if you want to finish that, you know, what the journalists should be reporting, the alleged officer, alleged, you know, one alleged officer to another. Okay, officer. I thought you were talking about a specific then, alert we put out because, no, 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 because I don't know if we, I mean, yes, the White House constantly said he has weapons of mass destruction, and then you would hear reporters saying, asking Saddam to, you know, reveal his weapons, as if he had some. The assumption is that he had them. But are you talking about specific sites that we showed? No, but what you just said there was, like, exactly something, like, what I'm kind of looking for okay. also. So if you can just, you know. Well, let, let me finish the other case. Okay. I'll try to make it as brief as I can. For instance, when Colin Powell addressed the UN Security Council, he played a piece of audio tape, which he claimed what represented one Iraqi officer talking to another about hiding some weapons of mass destruction. That showed up later on in news reports as a fact. Um, now, unless reporters actually independently confirmed what was on the tape, and that was indeed one officer talking to another, etc., professional journalistic standards demand that that journalist say that, no, um, <laughs> let's, it's it's too long. It takes too long to make that point. Okay, for so how you well, more of a general because it, it happened a lot more. You know, is what yeah. But I'm trying to think of how to say it. I mean, um, so in a in a media culture, in a media environment, uh, devoid of those dissenting voices, even those professional dissenting voices like Scott Ritter and Mel Goodman, where there's nobody questioning that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, you get media repeating as facts the things that White House sources are saying. So, for instance, the White House says over and over and over again, Saddam Hussein has this vast arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, and he's working actively to produce even more, and maybe he's even working on a nuclear weapon now. That becomes a matter of fact in the media, especially 
in the absence of those dissenting voices, especially in the absence of those professional dissenting voices, voices like Mel Goodman's or Scott Ritter's or, or Air Force um, intelligence officials who doubted uh, that Saddam Hussein had a significant ar arsenal of, mass, of weapons of mass destruction to begin with. Um, and so I guess what, 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 what journalists should do is say alleged weapons of mass destruction or uh, you know, what should they say? And so there were countless times when journalists re referred to Iraq's weapons of mass destruction as a matter of fact, when they should have been saying uh, the weapons of mass destruction that the White House alleges Iraq has. So in other words, unless these journalists and these media outlets have independently confirmed that Iraq has these weapons of mass destruction, they are really bound by journalistic standards to say the arsenal of weapons of mass destruction that the White House claims Iraq has. Um, that wasn't good, well done. Um, so in other words, unless these journalists have independently confirmed the existence of this Iraqi arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, they are really obliged to refer to these as allegations by the White House. In other words, to say uh, the, the arsenal of weapons of mass destruction that the White House claims Iraq has. Did that work? I think so. Out of all the ones that we'll probably have. You'll find something. And let me just... Any other last thoughts about the Iraq war coverage that you have to do now? Well, it's so limiting when you can just go uh, in the run-up to the war. It's, it's um, you know, you cut me off on the one before. I, I know you had what you wanted from it, but it was an important point in the run-up to the war. And that was, you know, it, it was another point. I've made the four points, uh, broad oh. debate, that. I don't have to go down those, but I just want to say, let me tell the story about Rumsfeld appearing oh, uh, yes. on there because the second part was kind of important. It may take too long to tell and you might not be able to use it, but okay. it's good background just, anyway. Right, go and that it. is, um, to give an example of where a journalist failed to ask tough questions of, of a powerful person. It, several months before the Iraq war started, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, appeared in a one-on-one -on -one interview with Jim Lehrer on the news hour with Jim Lehrer. And in the course of the interview, Rumsfeld said two things that were utterly false. He said, one, that Saddam Hussein kicked the weapons inspectors out of Iraq in 1998. The second thing that he said was that in 1990, Iraq had mobilized an army of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and were poised to invade Saudi Arabia. Back in 1990, indeed, the first Bush White House claimed to have secret satellite photos of such a mobilization. But they never produced those photos. And in fact, an enterprising journalist at the St. Petersburg Times, Gene Heller, actually, after asking the White House to produce the photos and them saying they would not, uh, she went to a private satellite company and got satellite photos of the exact same area at the exact same time. And the St. Petersburg Times hired two professional analysts of satellite photos who both concluded that the photos showed no mobilization at all. Besides a few lonely border sentinels, there was no army, no mobilization, no nothing. Well, it was that claim that the White House had used to bring the Saudis into the U.S. coalition for the first Gulf War. So here we are, years later, in 2003, Rumsfeld's repeating this story that has never been confirmed, that Gene Heller at the St. Petersburg Times has since labeled a lie, and not being called on it. What's the important moral of this story? Uh, uh, sorry. <clears throat> so to make a long story short, Donald Rumsfeld, appearing several months before the war on the news hour with Jim Lehrer, tells Jim Lehrer, one, that Iraq kicked the weapons inspectors out in 1998. That's false. Two, he tells Lehrer that in 1990, Iraq had mobilized an army of hundreds of thousands to invade Saudi Arabia, another falsehood. How does Jim Lair confront this? He doesn't. He just lets those statements stand and go by without comment. What's the moral of the story? It's not that government officials lie. Government officials always lie. They especially lie during times of war. The, where, where democracy breaks down is where you do not have a journalist there to confront 
the lying government official, and that's exactly what happened. Um, when journalism and indeed democracy breaks down is when a public official lies and there's no one there, no journalist there, to challenge them on it. And that was the problem. And this is, and I think, though I'm singling out Jim Lair here, he's really emblematic of so much that happened across the media in the run-up to this war. Very little scrutiny, very few tough questions. Okay, and just, um, just the last thought I want to get is that, you know, you can maybe say that on its own without, without the context of the Jim Lair. Is that sure. Generally, that the journalists, that there were lies being told and they didn't do their job in that. In that, yeah, um, that, that same last thought that you had. We, the people, in order to fulfill our role as citizens in a democracy, need broad-ranging and independent information. Where democracy breaks down is when a public official lies and there's no journalist there to call that public official to account. Is that all right? Should I try it one more time? Yeah, just one more time. And okay. And we, the people, Americans, in order to fulfill our role as citizens in a democracy, need broad-ranging and independent information. And where democracy breaks down is when a government official lies and there's no journalist there to call them on it. Is that all right? Perfect. Good. Okay. Great. <laughs>